Now, next week, we mark Cancer Survivors Day. And cancer remains a huge health burden in this country as the third leading cause of death in Kenya. According to the National Cancer Registry data uh, for 2021-2022, just over 42,000 new cancer cases are recorded every single year. Now, the most common cancers in order of prevalence were breast, cervical, uh, esophagus and prostate and colorectal were fourth and fifth. Now, the regional cancer registry at Kemri indicates that about 80% of reported cases of cancer are diagnosed at advanced stages when very little can be done to cure the patient. And this is now further exacerbated by the fact that we still don't have enough oncologists in this country. But another statistic that is concerning and lessening people's chances of beating cancer is the fact that 23% of patients do not seek care. And this is for several reasons, either systemic and attitude barriers that include the high cost of treatment, long distances to access facilities, and in some cases, inadequate information on health care. Well, joining me virtually from Mombasa is Richard Kiyoko Kiundi. He is an entrepreneur and an author and was diagnosed with stomach cancer in 2013. And in studio is Mildred Ngesa, a life coach, speaker, communications trainer and breast cancer warrior. Thank you both for joining me. Mildred, let me Thank begin you. with you. When you first found out it's cancer, what was going through your mind at that time? Devastation, mm. devastation, your life stops. Okay. You go out walking, you wonder how come people are walking and I have been diagnosed with this beast. Mm. So it kind of, you actually go on a, st on, a, on a standstill. You are paralyzed from inside out. Uh, the devastation comes from fear. Mm. One of the main reasons that drives, that stops people from seeking treatment or, 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 or intervention is fear. Yeah. And fear is actually brought about by the stigmatization of cancer as a death sentence. So when that comes in, then people feel like they can't even talk about it. They have to whisper about it. Mm -hmm. Now I had to go through a journey to overcome that. But you see, the first instinct is fear. When you're a parent with children, your first thought is your children. Exactly. You say, oh, what diagnosis is that I have children? And you know, so that's your first pair of call. And then you have to work on the inside to get to a point where you can stare the beast in the eye and say, you know what, I'm going to fight and so, I'm going to fight you. How did you decide to fight? What was the treatment regimen like for you? Before treatment, there's God. Mm. I always tell all cancer warriors that there has to be a God you're hanging on to. When you have a beast as big as cancer, it's not your war. Yeah. It's bigger than everything else you want to encounter. And so one of the top lessons that I give out is what I learned myself at the beginning, mm -hmm. is you can worry or you can trust God. You can't do both. You can worry or you can trust God. You can't do both. Yeah. Now, it's a difficult call. It calls you to a moment of faith that you can't believe. So you're battling a beast. It's big. You've read about it. You have Googled about it. You have heard about it. You have witnessed. You've seen death. You've seen, you've seen it all. Right. So suddenly it's you. You are a statistic now. So did you do chemo, radiotherapy? I did all. Okay. All the treatment regimes there. I started with surgery. Then I went into chemo. I did eight sessions. Then I did 31 sessions of radiotherapy, and I'm still on oral therapy right now. For the next five years, this is my year three. Wow. So I still have uh, two more years to go uh, as, as, I, as I finish my medication. So let me take you back a bit because, um, you know, a lot of times people say it was a lump in the breast, it was something. What kind of put you on this idea that it could be something? It worrying? didn't start as a lump for me. And this is the talk I give women. Of course, we are told, told, told about lumps. And it's important to know because you have to do your breast checks. Right. For me, it started with a rash. It started with a, something that looked like an infection in the breast. Mm -hmm. And I was concerned. And the first one, uh, diagnosis was a misdiagnosis because they checked and told me, oh, you have mastitis. And I thought, what mastitis? I'm not breastfeeding. My, my, my child is not, so, I'm not breastfeeding. And so I took antibiotics for three days and no, that was not it. And so feeling like I need to check out a breast specialist. At that time I wasn't thinking cancer. Mm -hmm. I was thinking maybe I've got an infection that's funny. 
And so I actually Googled for breast specialists, and thank God I landed into one of the most amazing breast specialist science uh, 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 cancer su surgeons we have in the country, yeah. Dr. Edwin Otieno at the breast clinic at the Nelson Awari Center. And I loved that, that we started there. We started from learning, from him saying, let me teach you. Step by step, these are the tests we need to go through. Mm -hmm. So let us just, for a whole month, I was going through a diagnosis process, including targeted biopsies, including scans and everything else, mammograms, oh, mammograms for all women. So important, it's over really 35, important. Yeah. jump into it. Once a year, once, once every year, very good for us. We have to keep checking. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we can get Richard uh, on the line, not yet. Okay, let me pull up a picture of you. Yeah. Uh, and this was after chemo, you lost your hair. Yes. That of course is one of the byproducts of going through a treatment like that. Yeah. But what were some of the things going through your mind? I know you said the first thing was your daughters, yes. your children. Yes. You've lost your hair, that usually is a sign of, this is real now. Yes. So what was going through your mind during that time? Well, I'll tell you what happened to me because I had read about it and I had prepared, I think. Yeah. Um, I knew I was going to lose hair when I started chemo, at the onset of chemo. Chemo came after surgery. So a month after surgery, I had to get into chemo. And I had read about it. My friend, Rochelle, who loves her bald hairstyle, <laughs> came to my house one morning just before chemo and said, you know what, let's do this before it happens. And wow. so I actually shaved it. But the truth of the matter is that chemo is not a joke. So you lose air, uh, hair everywhere. So everywhere you can imagine there's hair, you lose it. And so you prepare yourself psychologically. It's terrible going to the bathroom to shower and hair is falling off and hair is falling from your head. But then you know that there is treatment going on. You know that there is something going on in your body so you actually face it. And you have no choice. You start chemo, you don't stop. You have to do them after every three weeks. You've got eight sessions you have to push. You don't stop. So you just try and build it within yourself to keep going. Let's talk about the money aspects because that's one of the uh, deterrents for a lot of people who think, you know what, let me just let it take its course because I simply can't afford it. Um, there was a statistic by WHO that said about a million Kenyans are put into poverty because of hospital bills. And because of can how cancer is not a pandemic in this nation, I don't understand it. Mm. Because every single day, I want to assure you, I get a call to walk with a survivor or somebody who's just been diagnosed. Every single day. Today, I got three before I came to this show. So how it's not a pandemic, I don't understand. In the small hospital where I did my surgery, here in Nairobi that has 12 beds, they told me by the end of the week, we have done at least seven or eight mastectomies in a very small hospital. Oh. So it's not Kenyatta Hospital, it's not a big district hospital. It is costly, it is expensive. For me, it is friends who came together colleagues in the media, yourselves, mm. who raised money for me within a month, within two months, for us to get the amount of money we need to start off uh, surgery, to get into chemo, to get into radio. It is so expensive and many people, many warriors give up because of the amount. You just need to look into the social media pages. Everybody's raising money for cancer. Why this government does not look at it as a pandemic, it beats me. Now, for us women, even worse, the first two killer cancers in the country affect women. Right. It's breast, and it's cervical. cervical, that we get to the rest. Yeah. Why it is not a pandemic, I don't know. I keep telling governors from or political leaders from across, I say, you know, just try and take a roll call around your, your, your county. How many cancer uh, uh, warriors do you have? How many people are presenting with cancers? Right. Just that. So you just get a list. Let's get to Richard. Yeah. Um, he is on the road, but we at least have his audio. Richard, when you first got your diagnosis, uh, saying that it was stomach cancer, what were some of the symptoms that you were experiencing? Um, well, it wasn't, it was just a, a general stomach upset. That, that would go away, um, you know, I would go to the hospital, well, one of the clinics near where I live, I get some medication, uh, seven days, you know, the thing goes away, then uh, after it's gone, after I finish the medication, maybe another one week, it comes back. It was basically just bloating. So when you decided to go for a checkup, what, what, what did they tell you? Well, because I kept on, because I kept on um, getting these symptoms, I decided to actually go and now get a specialist. So I looked for a, for a, what are they called? These people, these, these, these doctors who take care of the alimentary canal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, 
uh, so I did a checkup. Basically, you know, I was taken, they did that endoscopy and, and uh, colonoscopy. And then that's when they found this uh, swelling, this, uh, you know, where, where the sphincter muscle is. I think, I hope, you know how the alimentary canal looks like, where it becomes a large, they see the small or the large intestines, where it changes into intestines. There was this uh, pimple. No, it was not really a pimple. It was a tumor. Mm. And so they took up bits of it. Yeah, they took up bits of it now for see. And uh, well, we, we came back after maybe a week or so, and that's when we were told that uh, uh, you know that it was cancer. I hope we haven't lost you, uh, Richard. I've put up some photos there of you receiving radiotherapy uh, in India because you decided to also do treatment there. Many Kenyans decide to go abroad. Thanks, because of the cost. Um, you know, what was that experience like for you? Okay, one of the things is I had a very good insurance. I had a five million shilling insurance, so I was not too worried. Mm. So, you know, I did a surgery uh, locally, which cost some 1.5 million. And then uh, um, I went to see an oncologist who said, at that time, we didn't have the pet CT. There is a pet CT now at, uh, at Aga Khan, and I think there's one at Kenyatta, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have any here. And so the doctor said, I either go to South Africa or to Egypt or to India, at least to get properly staged so that she will know what she's going to be dealing with. So I, off, I went to India and I got this uh, diagnosis that, OK, the cancer was not there. So it was just preventive. It, it, I think they, the surgeon managed to remove all the tissue that was, uh, that was infected, that, was, that had been affected. So, of course, now I still had to do some uh, pro preventive chemo and radiotherapy. I was given six chemos and 25 radio. So when I came back to Kenya to start it, um, the amount of money that was required, I couldn't afford. Mm. So now I started, I need to, so I had to go back to India where it was my, here I think it was coming to something like 4 million shillings. In India, they gave me a quote of 1.2 million. Wow. So, of course, that, and then at that point, the insurance had said they, they don't cover cancer. So we were already in court. You know, they refused to pay the bill at Nairobi Hospital. Uh, the bill was 1.5 million. Uh, they paid half a million, so I had to look for the 1 million. Yeah. Now, to go to India, I had to fundraise. Uh, but as I keep on saying, you know, some of these uh, networks that you create when you're young really come to help. So my high school and university mates came together and put the money. So I went to India, um, where I did six chemo, and I did three chemo and 25 radiotherapy. Then I came back to the country and continued with the rest of the, the, the chemo here locally. But I brought my own medicine from, uh, from India because it was affordable. It was more affordable. You're now several years now, past it, Richard. Yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so now uh, I was told in India that I have to keep on going back every year for a checkup uh, for five years. I've just had my colleague say that she's on year three. Right. So I did my five years. I finished them in 2018. So now I'm on year 10 after the diagnosis, after the treatment. Um, and I, I did a PET CT two years ago here locally where with my oncologist and I'm still clean. So I think I'm one of those people who had um, not too bad. It, it's, it's not been a very bad experience, except of course, I know that somewhere there's some cancer lacking in my body. So I don't know whether it will wake up again and start these manenos and that kind of thing. That's exactly what I was about to ask you. Do you fear um, you slipping back into another case, another bout? Victoria? Do you fear it you coming back? Something. Sorry? Do you fear the cancer coming back? Yeah, that is, that is something that is in the back of my mind all the time. Every time I get a small pain, I'm like, is it coming back? Mm. You know, the thing is, um, what I was told was cancer is never really cured. It just goes into remission. Right. So it could come back or it might not come back. You know, it's, it's like somebody's holding a loaded yeah. gun. I think there's something I read somewhere, and I've also put it in my book. By the way, I talk about my experiences with cancer a lot in that book. Yeah. Mm. So there is, there, it's like somebody is holding a loaded gun at the back of your head and told you, just don't worry about it. Assume this gun is not there, but I might choose to shoot you or not shoot you. But, uh, you know, just know I'm here and you, uh, you uh, ignore me. That is what, you know, the kind of feeling that you get. That you know there is a problem, but you don't want it to rule your everyday things. That you don't want um, to be, you know, to be a victim. Because one of the things, if you, I think I'm one of the ones who started talking about cancer warriors instead of cancer survivors, mm -hmm. because it's not just survival. Mm. It is a major battle. Yeah. And not only is it physical, 
but it's also emotional. It's also, you know, intellectual. It's every way that you have to convince yourself that this is an animal that I'm going to beat. This is an animal I've beaten. You know, as we're listening to you, Richard, Mildred is here nodding her head, affirming literally everything you're saying. Um, and let me, let me put the same question to you, Mildred, because that imagery that Richard just described of a loaded gun in the back of your head saying, don't worry about it, it won't go off. And, you know, how do you keep a positive mind knowing that it could come back? Every single day you think about the beast. It doesn't go away. You have scars, they remind you, but you know that you have, you have been battling. But every single day you renew your spirit. Every cancer death that you read about, that you hear about, diminishes you. Because you're still battling, you're still a warrior, as Richard says it rightfully. Mm -hmm. You're in the battlefield. So every cancer death diminishes you. So you have to try and work on your insides again to pull up the struggle. And this is why I say that the way we treat or deal with cancer warriors, cancer survivors, has to have a positivity that, was, uh, that has an extremely higher notch. Mm. Because already just carrying the burden of the beast is one of the heaviest things that they can carry. They want to know that life still goes on. So one of my resounding taglines is, every day is a good day because I'm still here. Mm. So I say whether I can have bad days when I'm very sick or I can have good days when I'm not sick. But every day is a good day because I'm still here. That positive attitude was instilled to me by my doc doctor from the start. And he told me 90% of this treatment will come from your attitude. So let me know how your mind is taking this up. Leave the 10% for me and my science. Mm -hmm. the 90% your attitude here. And this is the call I want to give everyone because it looks grim, it looks bad, it looks very grim, it looks bad. But you could be in the other percentage that, that really should not feel like darkness has fallen all over. So it's about just pulling up, pulling up your light as you battle a very dark beast. We're about to wrap up the conversation, but um, Richard, what gives you hope to continue and what lessons have you learned through the journey? One of the things, um, Victoria, I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the serenity prayer. Mm -hmm. mm. You have, yeah. yeah. You know, this, this is the thing of that which you can't do, that which you can't do anything about, um, you hope and pray that God tells you this one you can't handle, so you pass on. Now, the issue of something like, you know, this, this disease, this cancer, and I like what Mitred says, that every day is a good day. Mm. But the thing is, uh, you know you can't do anything about it. So it will not help you to worry about it. Yeah. Because then it's just going to bring you down. And as she says also, is it's really your state of mind which makes your body want to fight this thing. You, you tell your mind, in your mind, you're saying that I'm going to beat this disease. Yeah. So your body also actually now comes in and says, yes, let's beat this. Mm -hmm. So that positivity of not thinking about the negatives, of looking at every day, looking at, this, you know, putting your face to the sun so you don't see those ugly things like the shadows and all that. That is what makes it, you know, from day to day. It, so it's, it's, it's like, I have my life. So as long as I've got it, uh, let me keep on. Yeah. So you don't keep on thinking about the negativities. Yeah, we keep going. Mildred, I have to ask this because cancer is one of those debilitating diseases, at least for women, when it comes to breast cancer, um, where you lose attributes that make you feminine, right? You've been through a mastectomy. Yeah. You lost your hair. These are things that make you feel like a woman. Yeah. You've gone through the process of removing some of those things. Yeah. How did you regain your confidence or are you still on that journey? By tapping into my feminine divinity. Hmm. And that has got nothing to do with your physical appearance. The feminine divinity is inside you. You know you are a woman, whether you are less one breast or less two breasts or no hair or whatever. You are a woman. What is that divinity that you know about who you are? about yourself and don't allow anything physical to describe who you are. And I tell women not to fear. In my battle, I'm meeting women who've had double mastectomies and we wear prosthesis and we walk and you can't tell. They've had lymphonectomies right in there, but they also wear prosthesis and they walk and life goes on. When I see women who've had mastectomies and they're just battling it out, I say, my goodness, you are in the battle of your life. You fought for yourself, you fought for your children. You're still standing, I affirm you. And that is what I want to affirm, not only women cancer warriors, all the cancer warriors. My brother Richard out here speaking so strongly because top stomach cancer is one of the most difficult the most tedious and very challenging. Mm. Keep going. 
keep walking because we are still here. The fact that we are still here, you keep going. Lessons learned from Richard, I have them in a list. Yeah. Number one, like I say, you can worry or you can trust God. You can't do both. Number two, debunk your fear, go for those checkups. Go to a specialist, go to a doctor. It's better to know than to not know and come when it is too late. At least that one my doctor told me. Number three, never let cancer warriors go silent. Now we have a tendency of fear, the stereotype and stigma associated with cancer makes us tiptoe around cancer warriors. We're tiptoeing, we're silent, you're keeping quiet. Don't call her, don't give her jobs. Don't. No, 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 no. You don't want me to wallow in silence when I am in the thick of my misery. Don't let them go silent. Go visit, take them out, tell them let's go to the sun, let's go to the shopping mall. Let's go for a holiday, you're feeling better. Let's try and do some work. Are you able to sit up and do a virtual meeting? Are you don't let cancer warriors go silent. Silent. Number four, please, 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 you have to know that faith plays an important role and I'm emphasizing. It doesn't matter who you are. At some point during treatment, it's you and whatever is going in and your creator. So where do you go? Where do you start? And when things are difficult, when you're trying to raise money, nobody's raising money, where does it come from? But cancer has put me down for two years where I wasn't able to work properly. Mm -hmm. I'm now on my feet, still on treatment, but I thank God I'm able to work. There are those of us who the beast has battered badly, uh, down so badly, yeah. they can't go back to work. How do you get up? You know, so for me, it's a, it's a, I, I find that cancer calls us to actually reflect deeply into our humanities. You know, because we have to come in and stand up for somebody who's, who's battling. Mm. And then we have to sit there and watch them. We don't know how the battle goes. Yeah. We have to put up a smile and tell them, you can do it. You can still do it. You can fight. For me, it's my daughters. I have two daughters. Just looking at them and watching them smile and watching them say, oh, mommy, today you look at, mommy, the blackness in your hands is gone. Yeah. Mommy, your tongue is no longer black. Oh, mommy, look at your nails. The blackness is gone. That excitement in my kids' faces would tell me, keep going, because now those are the effects of chemo and everything just changes, so hope. Hope is at the top of it. I'm a hope advocate. Hope is at the top of it. Whether there's money, there's no money. You're still here. So now let's keep going. Chin up. Let's just keep going. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mildred. Richard, thank you so much for your time, for your candor. Uh, and, you know, keep sharing the Can I just stories. say something, Victoria? Yes, yes, go ahead, Victoria, Richard. Can I just say something very briefly? Yeah. Yes, one of the biggest problems we have, you know, like um, when, when, when I came back from India, I joined an organization that was called Limau Cancer Connection. Mm -hmm. We were activists uh, about cancer. And we tried to, to lobby the government to declare cancer a national disaster. We didn't get very far, mm -hmm. unfortunately. We got a lot of service. And may I also mention that's the time when I first met, because I was going around meeting cancer warriors in Kisumu, in Mombasa, you know, all over mm -hmm. in the slum areas. There are very many of them. And that's when I first met uh, a, a male uh, cancer breast uh, warrior, mm. you know. But, uh, but the thing is, uh, some of these diseases like cancer, we are basically on our own. Mm. Uh, we don't expect any help from the government at all, at all. It's you, your friends, your family, and your God. Well, the hope thank is, you. Thank you so much. The hope is this conversation actually spurs some action from government. They do watch our shows and this platform, um, but keep the pressure on. Yeah. That's the whole point. Keep these conversations going. But thank you so much again for your time and uh, keep fighting. Thank you. Keep fighting. Thank you. On that note, that does it for Citizen Weekend. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Victoria Rubadiri. Our sign language interpreter tonight has been Yula Nzali. Have a lovely evening. One Love is up next. Bye.